Uh, my wife Rachel is a much better architect than me. Let's start like that. That's for the video. We'll go on later. Um, yes, thanks for the introduction, Will. Um, as Will said, I studied my part two and part three here. Um, this is the last presentation I gave, which was to a class of nine-year-olds. I think that Yasmin was really interesting about cloning things, but that's not really my area. Tim, on the other hand, was my area. Programming, machinery, yes please. This was the best presentation. Andrew was okay. I'm not interested in architecture that much, really. Um, so during my part two, um, I spent the summer in the Reba Library, looking at every drawing that Corbusier had made, because I was interested in how he, he used um, human figures in his drawings, um, and how he talked about it in his architecture, uh, which is kind of his famous expression of that was the modular. And the first week back, um, in part two, I did what I thought was quite a witty drawing of Ronaldo in a similar pose, um, which my tutor thought was funny as well, and I ended up stuck with it for the whole year. Um, and I ended up you know, doing things like this, which I sort of regret now. Um, but really what I just want to say is part two is such a great opportunity to kind of be a bit self-indulgent and you know, really kind of spend time looking at what, what moves you and what interests you because um, it's a unique opportunity. Um, and do, you know, don't get pushed down a path you're not interested in. After completing part two, I went to work for Edgley Design, who is a small practice based in East London. Uh, I spent three years of the five years there working on this house, which was for my boss, um, so it had to do a good job on it. Um, it was designed around a 100-year-old pear tree. It had this sort of glass link between the two main masses of the building, which was floating, i.e. it had no foundations. That was to protect the roots of the tree. So we, as a practice, also acted act as the contractors on this project. So I helped out on site building stuff. Um, everything in the project's bespoke. All the sort of, all the glazings bespoke with um, custom-made aluminium trims. All the copings were bespoke. Handrails bespoke. There's a lot of in situ concrete in the project, um, which was a great thing to kind of experience and work with. Um, you know, everything from the kitchen units um, to the worktops and you know, everything bespoke. So that was a great experience for me as a part two, uh, especially kind of the experience of being able to help out on site and really kind of feeling, you know, what it's like to put stuff together. And it really helps you when you get to kind of thinking about detailing in, in 2D. After um, five years at Edge Design, moved to Denners and Works. Um, as Will said, a small office of about five people. Um, I spent probably two years on the phone explaining to people how to spell our name. Uh, Davison Works, Venison Works, some of the stuff we get through the post. The best definition, almost poetic definition of a denizen is a plant naturalised on foreign soil. And that's kind of how we see our work. We try to make things which become of their place. The practice was really built off the back of this, which is house number seven. It won the Stephen Lawrence Prize um, and sort of 14 other awards for you know, Grand Designs House of the Year. It's on the Isle of Tyree, which is on the, it's the westernmost of the Inner Hebrides. This was the starting point, which was a, a Grade B listed ruin. And the inspiration for the building comes from kind of the idiosyncratic vernacular of the island architecture. So stuff emerges over time and need and just gets sort of bolted on but we kind of found beauty in the way that these things are put together. And the agricultural buildings which populate the island. And the project's about bringing these kind of quite humble materials together and then refining them through the detailing. This is the interior of the, the main sort of living space. On Tyree, a lot of the, the rooms are sort of clad in pitch pine. So we use old skirting boards on the ceiling and whitewash them. So using kind of familiar materials in a slightly different way. We also do some housing. Um, this is a block of flats in Whitstable. It occupies a prominent position uh, just off the train station. Our client wanted something with a distinct visual identity and talked about the place. This is Whitstable Seafront, sea uh, which is populated by these timber-clad black fishermen's huts, which is kind of inspiration for the form and the tonal kind of working of the brickwork. 
The project features these faience tiles, which are bespoke, handmade up in Blackburn. Faience is a uh, glazed terracotta. And that's kind of a play on a lot of the houses around there, these little terracotta sort of embellishments on the front elevation. So we took that, made them quite sculptural, and used them on the front facade. Some of the brickwork's not quite as good as it should have been in places. Uh, this was where our bricky was caught cheating on his wife. It kind of shows in his, his work on site a bit. It's important to remember, though, that you know, buildings are made by people. Um, our clients... There's two clients on this project. One of them sort of a day-to-day -day running. The other's more of a kind of sleeping partner who kind of provides the money. he will sort of turn up to one meeting per project and ask where the TV's going. Uh, but he did show an unusual interest in this project and so, sort of sat up all night making these kind of weird door handles in Microsoft Word or something. Um, but what we like to do is, you know, bring people along as part of the process and kind of celebrate these things. So we took one of his designs and kind of, you know, made it a bit more simple we just kind of let him have that as a you know a piece of the building. We're very lucky to have a lot of sort of projects in beautiful landscapes, um, and I think that comes from sort of the first project, which was on Tyree. Um, this is a project for the National Trust for Scotland at Inverview Gardens, which is on the northwest coast of Scotland. It's a world famous botanical garden. The client wanted us to create uh, a high level walkway um, to give views through the trees. Um, but when we were speaking with the guy running the site, he kind of talked about kind of the lower part of the site, which wasn't really used. So our proposal, you know, created this high-level walk, but also sort of connection down to the lower part of the site. And then we stacked it with accommodation, so there's a kind of an experience as you progress through the building. This is a visualisation of the project, which has just started on site. And one of the ideas we had was kind of like a woodpecker's nest in that the internal space is kind of sort of disguised or hidden or surprising from the external treatment of the facade. So this is a section through the building. You, you sort of enter at this level into a triple height space through quite a narrow doorway, so you get the, the drama of the, the height and the space. Uh, there's bird highs on top. Um, there's space for an artist to occupy and a gallery space as well. And they make the use of different views across the site and the light changing throughout the day. This is Princess Anne laying the foundation stone. Uh, no one actually saw sort of put it in place though, so she could sort of just pull the cover off it. So I'm really here to talk about the, the Floating Church, which is another project we're working on, which is very shortly to be completed. This is the image which was on the, the brief. So it was a, um, an invited competition. I think there were six practices invited. Um, and when we saw this, we were kind of put in mind of um, Oscar and Lucinda, which is a novel by Peter Carey. Her true ambition was to build something extraordinary and fine from glass and cast iron. Glass laced with steel, spun like a spider web. The idea danced around the periphery of her vision, never long enough to be clear. When she attempted to make a sketch, it became diminished, wooden, inelegant. Sometimes, in her dreams, she felt she had discovered its form, but if she had, it was like an improperly fixed photograph which fades when exposed to daylight. She was wise enough, or foolish enough, to believe that this did not matter, that the form would present itself to her in the end. So we had these kind of grand allusions to this soaring steel and glass structure. Kind of the next page of the brief said it had to go around the London Canal Network uh, and, you know, pass under bridges and stuff. So our, our dreams were quickly, to, quickly over at that point. Um, What's interesting about the brief is that um, the client, which is the Diocese for London, um, are interested in establishing new com communities in developing communities across London. And what they realise is a lot of these new communities are located along the canal network. So rather than build temporary churches in these locations, the idea was sort of conceived to make a boat which could travel beyond these different spaces, spend five years building up a congregation for you know, reach, reaching critical mass and allowing them to build a physical presence on site. So the idea... So we were inspired by sort of church organ bellows and VW camper vans with a pop-out roof. This is an early concept sketch we made in the, a restaurant. So the idea is that it's low enough to pass beneath bridges, but when more the roof can pop open to create this conspicuous presence, which was part of the brief. 
Um, so it really becomes this kind of almost Chinese lantern at night. Um, and similarly, during the day, light will filter through to create kind of a dramatic internal volume you know, and a space that's kind of fit for worship. This is uh, an early concept model we made to kind of test the quality of the light just out of a kind of origami and folded um, tracing paper. Quite an austere interior at this point. So we won the competition, um, despite being up against some sort of bigger and more experienced practices. Uh, one of the other competing architects also lived on a boat, so they had kind of a good knowledge of how it worked. But I think where we were successful is we kind of realised our limitations in that we're architects, we don't know about boats. So the first thing we did was get a boat builder on board, and he was part of our team. After we won the project, there was kind of a series of stakeholder workshops. So this, these are the local parish guys. Um, who will be sort of running the boat. Um, and this is Linda, who's part of the client team. And we sort of marked out the space in their church hall to see how big it was, to give them an idea of what they could fit in the space. And we talked about how they'd use it, how people might sit there, the qualities of the materials they wanted, the kind of finishes that would be appropriate. This beautiful drawing just shows kind of schematic layout. So entrances from the side, so our original drawing would show sort of a pop-out roof at the back, but what that would mean is walking through these kind of utility spaces to reach the main hall, which wasn't ideal. So the idea is to clump the utility at the back where they can sort of plug in to the, the back of the boat where all the machinery is, and then give over the front of the, the boat to the main hall space, which is designed as a flexible space to accommodate you know, worship but other activities so that the church can rent out the boat to different user groups to generate additional income. So there's a series of sort of space pan exercises. This is, you know, a Sunday service, a parent and toddlers group, and a supper club. And they've actually got a temporary vessel down on site at the moment, and, and food's one of the things which they say is really good for kind of getting people talking and bringing the community together. So it's kind of going to be an interesting part of the programming, sort of when the boat's finally on site. And then this is a drawing we did to kind of show the materials that we were proposing. So it's a marmolium floor, which is a type of linoleum, so it's very thin, sort of a few mil thick. And that's important because the head, right, head height is very restricted. Uh, there's Valcra mat, which is kind of a through-coloured MDF for this sort of fixed bench seat, and which also has, you know, you can lift the lids to put storage in. Uh, anodized aluminium windows, whitewashed birch ply walls. This is what we call the crown, which kind of conceals the bellows when the roof's closed, and then just a white painted ceiling. And there's a large roof light up there to let in additional light. So raising the roof. So the big sort of technical challenge on this project has been how do we lift the roof, how do we make the bellows? And the bellows is this bit we call between the roof and the, the top of the cabin, which kind of lets the light in for the translucent sail fabric. So part of our team is a naval architect called Tony Tucker. He does all his drawings by hand in pencil on A0 bits of paper. So it's been very difficult for us to sort of get stuff into CAD and draw up in our usual processes. But it's been an interesting experience and we've got these sort of amazing big drawings up in our studio. This is the roof itself which lifts. It's eight metres long, four metres wide, weighs nearly two tonnes. It's formed from aluminium so it's more light or lighter than steel. It features a 1.8 metre roof light. This was an early sketch by Tony for how to lift the roof. It was this scissor lift mechanism. Um, the problem with it is it's required this uh, crossbar to be installed manually after uh, to prevent lateral wind loads from distorting the, the scissor lift as it was raised. So we rejected that as a, it's kind of been, the idea was that this is something that one guy can put up. Um, so the idea that having to lift it, going around, putting this bar and then having to remember to take it out when you close the roof really wasn't acceptable as a design solution. We said, why don't you think about stuff that already exists? A lot of the answers we find to technical resolutions are already out there. It's just about repurposing them, so you know, a simple tipper truck with hydraulic arm. And that's what we've ended up doing. There's two hydraulic arms here. They're on these um, rotational pieces here to take into account the arc of the roof as it goes up and down. And then th these have been installed before the front plate goes on. So there's sort of oversized holes to allow the movement of that ram as it tilts backwards and forwards. 
and the front of the roof over sails so that when it closes up, it's all hidden. The other sort of key problem with this roof or design challenge was the bellows, which is really what, what the project's all about, how to achieve those. This was kind of the first ever sketch which uh, Jekylls, so they uh, make sails, um, and we got them on board to help with this project. Um, so their first idea was for a single skin of fabric which wraps around these poles. So when it's up, you have a single sheet to create this kind of articulated form. What we realised is there'd be a problem with, and this has been a big problem, is the idea of lateral wind loads coming in from the side and distorting the shape. And when the roof's closing, potentially catching them between the lid, the roof, and the cabin itself. So this is when these kind of um, restraint cords are introduced. And there's also these steel, steel struts to kind of help articulate this form. And this is a, another drawing showing kind of these restraint poles going up through the, the bellows themselves. And they made kind of a little origami model to explore how you could form the corners. The eventual solution was to have it make a double skinned wall. So what this allowed us to do was to introduce the poles in between so these restraint poles and they're laterally restrained by these horizontal polycarbonate stiffeners uh, at the widest points and at the narrow points there's just fabric ties between them. And there's a series of um, rope tracks which hold, hold in the fabric and these pieces can be individually removed if they ever get damaged. Um, and then this is kind of, we call it the gutter, so that when all this folds down, it's hidden in here and the roof oversails. This drawing kind of shows a section through the main hall space. This is the gutter I just talked about. So when this roof's down, it will all fold up in here and neatly be covered by this strip. So the double wall allows us to get, you know, improved thermal performance, acoustic performance. Um, is also to help with potential condensation being created and this is all drained so that any condensation building up can filter through and these are angled to allow rainwater on the outside to drip off back into the river or the canal. These are those restraint poles so they're encased between the windows and you kind of articulated these as columns and there's a series of them running up so you don't read them in, in the space itself and you can sort of see the curvature here which allows for the arc of the roof as it opens and closes. This is a section, cross section through the front, front of it. So we're getting sort of, you know, 1.6 metres height. There's 14 individual chambers, and each one's going to have um, LED lighting in them so that at night it can glow. We made a lot of prototypes. This is an early one, um, just showing a basic section, which was kind of manually lifted up and down to show how it folded into place. These are the aluminium uh, sail tracks and the fabric slid in in sections where they're jointed here. And then there's a, a piece of rope fabric which goes here to try and create a, a sharper edge. It's kind of a visual thing. And this is, a, again, a rather scrappy prototype, but it's showing the development of the corner. So the idea of these Velcro joints so that, you know, should any damage occur to these, you can take the corner off and slide these pieces out. So the, these bellows have been made um, at the sailmakers in Roxham, near Ipswich. You know, it's an amazing huge desk, which sort of waist tight and allows them to manipulate these large pieces of material. These are the polycarbonate stiffeners which are, have been manufactured. This, is kind of, this was taken a week or so ago, so it's kind of well underway. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the detailing in the project. So this is a part of the, the sail fabric. It's all hand stitched together. And there's this quite interesting sort of um, zigzaggy stitch detail. And we've kind of used that as a, a visual motif to help us with the detailing through the project. So it's been used to kind of inspire these window screens. So these are four mil thick aluminium anodized screens that close <coughs> over the windows. So if there's a service or some kind of some activity where you want a bit more privacy, you can lower these down over the windows and they fold into the soffit under sort of the crown of, of the space. This is them in situ. This is the aluminium. And they fit, in, they fit into these small catches, which you spin to hold in place. And this is one sort of 
you know, hidden under the, the soffit. The same sort of detailing has been used in the kitchen with these chevron tiles, again just picking up this recurring visual motif. All of the furniture in the, the space is bespoke because there's limited storage space, so this allows it all to be folded up, put onto these, these trolleys which slide in and out under the, the decks at the, the front of the boat. Um, and again you can sort, sort of see this V motif. It's even been used on the design of an altar. Um, so this is designed to fold up so it can be stored away. The front's formed from this material which is called plexwood, which looks like the end grain of plywood. Um, and it's put at 45 degree angles to create these Vs and kind of articulate a cross shape. Um, and the front of it's angled like the prow of a boat as well. This is a detail of one of the columns which conceals the restraint poles. We found these marine lights which have this sort of cross across them. Um, which we thought was a nice reference to the, the church side of the boat. Uh, and again, here's the built-in storage down here. And the plexwood has been used for the insides of the columns, so it looks like they've been chopped away as a really thick piece of plywood. I'll just finish with a few photos of con the construction process. So this is Turk's shipyard. Oh dear. Postpone. All right, ten minutes. Um, it's on the Thames Estuary in Chatham, Ch Chatham Historic Dockyards, an amazing place to go. This is an amazing space and our boat's sort of been built over here. And it's got a bit of a dry dock here so boats can be brought down the Thames, brought in here for maintenance. This is the early stages with the, the steel floor beams going in. It's then built up with a series of 60mm frames, which are then clad in steel. 6 mil thick steel. This is showing the hut where the cabin when it's nearly complete and you can see the gutter up here which is where the bellows are stored when it's closed. This is the line of the windows. So every other frame is cut out to make space for a window. They put these temporary pieces on to kind of hold it in shape before they do the final welds. You know there's loads of sketches going on, bits of the boats work stuff out. The, the curvature is quite a hard thing to make, so they sort of set out the, the frame and then use bits of hardwood to shape it and make templates. They then take this to a cutting bench and work the steel around it to get the correct shape. This is the, the cabin a bit more developed. You can sort of see the end of the boat. Timber joists in between the steel work to support the floor. So it's all underfloor heating, so there's no need for radiators. Um, we've got a quite a minimal build-up as well with the marmolium floor to kind of maximise what's limited headspace. This detail is of the hydraulic rams at the front of the boat and you can see the tracks which are going to accept the bellows at the bottom. And this is the underside of this roof here. So they will slot in there on site. This is a view kind of the outside of the boat at the front. This is in its fully raised position. Uh, to cut away a bit of the steel to get the rams in. You can sort of see the roof light in there. So a joinery detail with the marmolean. There's a shadow gap detail here. We'll run a light under there as well. So at night you'll get some nice effects running down the length of the boat. This is uh, installing sort of these plywood columns. We had this idea about entering into quite a dark space. So we've clad the walls in this dark Valka match, the through coloured MDF. And what's quite nice about this material is if you chip it, you still get the same colour through. It's not like a, a painted finish. Um, so it's quite robust. And the idea is you enter into this quite dark space before you move into kind of the light of the, the main hall. The next few photos just show development of the main space. This is the good architect, Rachel. And this is Ali who's sort of building it all on site. I think this is before the rounds went in, so they had a crane on site just to lift it up to kind of show us how the space would look. This is after all the joinery had been built and you know this thing we call the crown starting to go in. And that really demarcates the depth of the, the bellows when they're stored. This kind of it with some of the plastic off. Again, we're still waiting for the bellows to come to site, but you're starting to get a sense of the space. It's actually it's a really nicely scaled intimate space. Um, it's a, a scale we're not familiar working with. We're used to making 
you know, buildings on land where you can control the head height much more and you're com confident about the kind of the volume of the space and how it will feel. So it was always a bit of a there's always going to be a bit of a surprise how this space felt, but it's, it's actually really lovely. This is it with the roof down. So the interiors are pretty much finished now. A bit of finishing to be done on the doors. And then this is a view looking at the joinery of these built-in sort of monk's bench seating and the big roof light above. Now this almost certainly won't work, but we'll give it a go. So this is a pretty bad video I made on my iPhone. It stitched a couple of videos together, but just showing sort of the roof as it opens. And what's really nice is the change in scale as you, you sort of start in what's quite a, a tight space and it raises up. And it's trying to get the feeling of a, an ecclesiastical space where it's all about the volume and the light. Uh, and that's all. Thanks. Yeah, as long as they're not difficult ones, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can make a concrete boat as well. Uh, steel was chosen. Well, the reason we chose steel was the client had an idea about something that would last 50 years or longer. Um, and steel gives you that with the finishes that we can apply to it. Um, yeah, yeah, they're very familiar with it. Um, I think, you know, they've got a load of welders who kind of permanently at the boatyard and they just move from project to project building bits. There was one concrete boat on site which had failed several times. Uh, and it was kind of heartbreaking to see this huge thing which had to be completely destroyed and rebuilt. So I'm quite thankful we used the steel because it allows you to rework it. It's a bit more forgiving in that sense, I think. Um, so we drew what we thought would look nice to start with. Um, what the thing that restricts it are these restraint poles uh, to stop the bellows sort of blowing inwards because they have to be concealed within the height of these and it can't penetrate the deck below. So that kind of determined how high the roof would be, basically. Would we make a boat with them again? I uh, probably wouldn't make something else for them. <laughs> They're very good at boats. Um, it's an interesting way of working. It's very different to how we make buildings in that we would always do very detailed specifications and list out kind of every part of the project. And they just weren't willing to cost the project in that way and they just put lump sums against everything and sort of work out as they go along. Um, and you certainly see the value of the way we, we do it with normal buildings because there's been a lot of errors in kind of the measurements of stuff and, you know, Allow, making sure that everything's been allowed for. Um, and I think a detailed kind of design exercise earlier in the process would have eliminated a lot of those problems that we had on site. Um, the client's been great though and kind of, you know, they're quite a conservative client body, um, you, but they've commissioned quite an exciting kind of project, um, which is full of risk. It's never, no one's ever built a roof like this before. Um, so it's something really new for them, but they've been really supportive and they've understood that this is a new, this is a prototype, as every building is in a way. Um, and they've kind of accepted, you know, that things have developed or gone wrong during the build, but they've been very supportive of allowing that to continue. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, the, one of the clients, uh, sort of the start of the project, has now moved on to other places, and she's really excited about this and the technology and about how we can use it in different places, and whether it's boats elsewhere across the country, as a way of 
kind of engage in you know these parts of parts of towns and cities um, which you know are linked to the canal networks. But then also, yeah, could it be used in a house? Could it be used in I don't know other buildings? It's kind of an exciting possibility, I think. For the bellows bits. Um, we, look, we started looking at sail fabric. Uh, what we ended up using was um, an architectural membrane, which they use on stadium roofs and stuff. Um, it's quite robust. Uh, we looked at a lot of things, for, you know, the quality of the light coming through them. It's double skin now, so we had to make sure that what we were going to propose is still going to kind of let that nice diffuse light in that we wanted. Um, so yeah, we explored a few options at the start, but kind of the, the solution really was about the robustness of it, the waterproof qualities, also the fire properties. So because this has been designed as a passenger sort of pleasure craft, again as another way of generating revenue for the church, so it has to comply with MCA requirements, which is sort of the water building regulations, I suppose. So it needs to be certain performances and materials in terms of their fire, their reaction to fire. So again, that, the fabric that was chosen was very good for that. Sorry? No. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> I mean, that was another reason why the sort of double skin thing was an improvement over the single layer. I think it would just help a little bit with all that kind of thing. Um, oh dear. Yeah, a lot of things about this, you know, you can't make a one-to-one -one test that this is the prototype. And, you know, I guess some things might not be right the first time. Um, you know, we've certainly done our best to kind of think through all the different scenarios and how the building's going to respond to those things and what the acoustics are going to be like and all that kind of stuff. But I guess, you know, it's going to be about testing it once it's there on site. No, it's all furniture. Um, so really the idea, they don't know exactly how its use is going to evolve over time and move into these different parishes across London. So the idea was just to give them a big open space and then lots of furniture which they can arrange in different ways. And so that's going to be a really exciting part of the project, I think, seeing how it's used by its users, I guess. Um, and, you know, what, what's successful there, what doesn't work. Um, so, yeah, no, no moving partition, just, just furniture. I guess that is interesting though about to talk about the use of this it's called the floating church the full project title is the floating church and community hub and that sort of community aspect is really important to the church it's not about this isn't a place just for Christians it's supposed to be somewhere where the whole community can come together and you know have interfaith celebration uh, it can be used for parents and toddlers group and it's really about becoming the focal point of the community beyond kind of religious sort of religious leanings I suppose <coughs> 